Hi. Hello. Just what I expect right out of lunch. Hi. Hi. Better. Hi, I'm Michael Batista, and uh, this talk is about creating a DVR using Python. Uh, just to give a little bit of, oh, that's right, I had to press restart. Uh, just to give a little background about me, uh, I'm a senior technical services engineer at Percolate. Um, in my spare time, I'm part of the technical team and an application developer for WDW News Today, a site all about Disney Parks news. Uh, I am, we can't call it staff because it's a nonprofit organization, but volunteer associate at San Diego Comic Con. I enforce it PAX. Normally, if it were any other weekend, I'd probably be a few blocks down over at New York Comic Con. Uh, I'm a former Perl developer in a past life, a uh, graduate from RPI, and just so you think I am not absolutely perfect, I have failed my road test in more than one state. <laughs> uh, if you need to find me, MV Batista on GitHub, Twitter, many other things. So before we start, a shameless plug for where I work, a wonderful place called Percolate. We create systems that unlock the potential for marketers. We are the leading content marketing platform for enterprise businesses. We have about 600 brands that use Percolate for their marketing, uh, network, marketing uh, coordination. Uh, we're headquarters in uh, Soho. We just had a nice big day-long convention called Transition about um, how marketing can work in the 21st century. Uh, Python is our main back-end language. We have some wonderful guys in engineering. We're hiring lots of Python engineers. A lot of work we're trying to do. This picture is actually taken from our hack day that we just had recently. Um, I wonder who that guy in the blue Hawaiian shirt is. So let's talk about building a DVR. So fat, life is kind of busy nowadays. I mean, we have to go to a Pi Gotham convention. Maybe you got to stay late and write code, and then make, gotta, you know your parents meet, meet you up for dinner, and then all of a sudden, hey, your friends from your old job are getting together the Friday night, and we're going to have drinking games, talking to Stephen Hawking. True story. So yeah, and then when you come home and your family wants to watch something, and everybody, it's like that set time. I know at home, my sister is going to get married next year, so there has been a lot. And I mean a lot of say yes to the dress at home. <sighs> hey, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you're the only one that wants to watch something else. And to this day, even my mother thinks that The Simpsons are not exactly quality programming. I mean, she was right n right now, but not right in the 90s. But sure. But at least we all agree on the Muppets. But. <laughs> And there's no room on the DVR, because sometimes people record big specials, and sometimes people want to record that hour and a half long CBS Sunday morning show in the morning on every Sunday morning. So, you know, so it gets to the point where you don't want to actually go into the DVR, put in a big one terabyte drive that you can get for like 80 bucks, and then you had to explain to Verizon or Optimum or Time Warner why you did that. So that's why I helped create the Bat DVR to watch everything. Of course, it's the Bat DVR because my last name is Batista. As you can probably tell from the laptop, I like Batman. It just kind of works. And of course, it wouldn't be by Gotham without a Batman reference because Gotham. So what, a, what is the Bat DVR? So in order to help me explain about what we're going to do with video, I am calling upon the god of war and examples, Bebo. If anybody knows who Bebo is, yes, Bebo. For those who don't, uh, from the show Legends of Tomorrow, Bebo is essentially their version in their universe of Tickle Me Elmo. The Legends of Tomorrow go through time, fixing anachronisms in time, just things that are off in the timeline. And so Bebo was around in the time of the Vikings, so they made him their god of war. Very funny show. So if we want to catch up with Legends of Tomorrow, usually you can go to their website, and they'll have like the latest five episodes right at the bottom. So you can at least kind of catch up a little bit. It may not be completely all there, but you'll have those five episodes. And those are the ones that we want to focus on so that we can continuously pull them. How are we going to get Bebo? So Bebo lives on the cloud. Bebo is some video file that a site is using to stream 
that we are going to find the source from the server and be able to either pull directly that video or reconstruct the stream onto using Python onto our local storage. I just put up there, that is a 20 terabyte NAS in uh, JBAD formation, so, and believe it or not, I've had to get it data recovery on it a couple of times. Now I know what you're thinking. Should I really be doing this? This, uh, this is where you should probably go to the ethics talk across the hall. But, so what I am doing is essentially using the same license that is used by one of the libraries in Python. So all I am doing is just essentially wrapping that tech, that into some other form of co configuration and well, more configuration and automation. So speak to your local lawyers on the part of it. I'm using on my project the Uni license, which is essentially this is code for the sake of code. Um, but that's I'm addressing it. I don't want to get into. Uh, hopefully, please do not sue me. <laughs> um, but we're taking, let's take a look at the actual software problem of how do we do the same thing for all of these sources and more. I'm just giving a few examples of what I've used with the Bet DVR in my experiments, Fox, FX, CW, ABC, CBS, NBC. So let's go back to one of my previous jobs at a place called Carhu. Show of hands, who has heard of Carhu? I thought so. That I, for everybody watching online, nobody raised their hand. Uh, Carhu was a, I have the next slide here. We existed, well we existed, long story. Um, we integrated with a lot of different existing taxi and livery companies that already exists. And we're compiling them so that you could choose in one app which ride service you wanted to use. Depending upon your location, depending upon the price, depending upon the time, we had Carhu integrating with all of these and it was a central experience so that you could choose which car you want. Um, background on it, it was based in London. They spent way much more than they should have. They were not expiring their promotional codes. So lessons learned. There's a wonderful Bloomberg article about the whole history of Carhu. So don't feel bad about too much about it being gone because we can take a look at some of the things that we did take out of Carhu. So for each of these different companies, some of them, they had a specific system for it. So like Carmel, they pretty much built their ride dispatch system Direct, only for Carmel. It was very custom coded. They worked off of an older uh, branch of one of the other types of integration platforms, but it, they essentially recoded some of it to make it more of their own. LimoSys was an example where this is a platform that integrates, people pay to use that to integrate with other uh, car companies, so they would sell their service to a whole bunch of different black car and taxi companies. Same with Aleph. They're all dependent, each of them had their own configuration. So what we ended up doing was creating processor files for each of those particular uh, platforms and had a base processor class so that the data can come out as a standard data object that we could use for our apps that would be customer facing. So now you're probably thinking, wait a second. There's interfaces to creation subclasses. Abstract creation process where you're not exactly sure which one you're going to be creating hard-coded. And common methods to each subclass. For those of you who have taken software design and documentation, does anybody see a pattern here? Maybe one of design? No? That's why I'm here. A factory design pattern. Maybe you've probably seen it in some of your courses where you are putting together shapes. So you have a common shape factory, and then you can say, I want to create a circle, I want to give a square, and I want to give a rectangle. And for each of them, you would have certain things like 
give me the perimeter, give me the area, draw it. But they would be centralized, but each of them would be, have their own functions for doing, their own implementations. The good things about this, it's very dry code. So there are a lot of things that you can inherit that you don't need to repeat yourself with. You can keep the same things over and over again. So like in Carhu's example, get where your cars are. I want to book a trip. I want to cancel a trip. I want to pay for my trip. And every child can overact, override their own actions to, for their own functions, as we mentioned before, with things like shapes. The extensibility of logic for each child just means that you're doing the same thing for all of them. And when you're creating a new one, you already kind of know what to do. It's like, OK, I need to do this, 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 this. I, you can see them in Python when you do your own, and, uh, own UML. So let's put some batteries in this remote and see how we are going to do this. Requests. I'm pretty sure everybody has heard of this. Who has not heard of requests? One? Wow. Uh, requests is a modern Python requirement nowadays for making uh, URL encoding for HTML, HTTP, GETs, PUSH, POSTS. Easiest way to do it. It's very simplistic, very user friendly. Beautiful soup. How many people have used this? About half, two thirds of the room. Cool. For those of you who haven't, has anybody not heard of Beautiful Soup? A one. Two, a couple. Oh. So Beautiful Soup is a web scraping library where you can pass it a string or even a document HTML, and it will parse the HTML very similar to jQuery. Um, there has a different, a couple of different processors that are Python based, like XML, XML or HTML5 lib, that help recognize the particular tags that are in HTML. Some people don't even know this comes from, from Alice in Wonderland, the name Beautiful Soup, because the original designer's idea was this kind of basing it of the idea of HTML being tag soup. So in Alice in Wonderland, this is Song of Beautiful Soup. That's the connection with there. Now YouTube DL, this is the library that really does the heavy lifting. It does about 90% of everything that's going to happen here. This is the one where I'm using the same license as them. So mine is just kind of an offshoot of what their library is doing. Go, over the, go for these guys if you need to. Uh, they handle a lot of sites. You can, a lot of times, you can just give this library the video that you want to get online. And nine times out of 10, they'll probably have a processor to help you do that. Because they have over a 1,000 issues with GitHub on their GitHub site. Um, they even have, in their integrations, Adobe Pass. So when you log into a, t um, a site and you say you need to have your TV provider, you can give them your credentials through your local television provider. And YouTube DL actually has the infrastructure to handle those requests for that authentication. And then afterwards, you can pass it in for some post-processing. Um, so if you have a iPhone or any device that you definitely need to have the output as an MP4 in order to have that display on your device when you're on the go, again, we move pretty fast. So internet may not be the best example, the best thing to have. So you have that. And another one we use is called Fuzzy Wuzzy. Has anybody ever heard of this one? A couple of people. Wow, I'm going to make your lives a lot easier here with this one. So our friends over at SeatGeek, they're about a few blocks uptown a bit. Uh, they made this, verse, this Python library to help with their classifications of events. Because they would get all this data, and sometimes you would just have it all in capital letters, New York Jets. Or sometimes they would just be texting it in all lowercase, New York Jets. Sometimes it would be uppercase, lowercase, New York Jets, and well, however they, however kids write it now, with the uppercase, lowercase, upper, lowercase. It's like camel case with a lot of humps. Uh, so they use essentially the algorithm that's in spell check, the Lubinstein distance, so that they can determine 
you give it a set of these are the possible solutions I know. What is the best possible match for it? I started using this with the Bat DVR project, and I've used this at work for a lot of data processing. It just makes cleaning data a lot easier when you have to go through it. All right. I have dropped enough names. Let's actually get to some of the process of what's going to happen. Let's go through a little bit of how we're going to handle all the channels. We're going to start by getting everything for a show, at least everything that's available, those five most recent ones. We grab the metadata for the show so that we, we know what file it is as opposed to possibly some random string of what it's, the, what the file is located online. We're going to do a check to make sure that we're not downloading the same things again, over and over again. Some DVRs actually have the ability to record the same show multiple times. I'm like, why? If it doesn't, if it's not there, then we're going to put it in the right place. And then possibly, as we said before, do some post-processing, try to get it so that we want it in the right format and video so that we can display it on whatever device we are using in the comfort of our homes or on the go, wherever. So let's take a look at how we're going to get all of those links to those episodes. Um, it depends, again, remember when we talked about the factory design pattern where everybody is different? So some sites that we've seen have some web scraping. So they actually are hard coding it, and you are getting it in the HTML what those links are. Some are a little bit modern, and we like that, where we can just get an API. APIs are fun, yay. But this way we know if we not have it working in our processor, we can throw the Python, not implement it error. So when we are doing the design, when we're building all of these new modules, that's actually the one to use. Chrome Inspector is going to be your best friend when you're taking a look because that'll show you how to load. If it even loads so fast because you have a wonderful high-speed internet connection at home, Chrome Internet Inspector can actually slow down things a bit. So that'll give you a chance to see, OK, this is happening and this is happening. So always a good thing to have when you're doing some web development. So the extract, and then so when we get that, we're going to pass that into the Python module of YouTube DL and put that into the extraction. So sometimes we get some data from back when YouTube DL passes the metadata. Sometimes we don't. A lot of places, a lot, some ones that I've tried now, they weren't giving the data. But um, nowadays, all of them do. But if they don't, sometimes if you're dealing with a television show, you can kind of look for a backup plan to get that data. So then I found TV Maze's API, which is a free API. If you ever are doing some sorting of video and you want to say, OK, I have all of these. It's like, this is episode 407. What was episode 407? You can use the TV Maze's API. You can go in and use that data to rename all of their files so that you can clearly identify them. Now, of course, as we said, everyone is different. So in the classes for each of these files, I have variables that I could say, OK, for this one, this is going to use the TV Maze API. This one's going to be fine. <coughs> so making sure that we have a unique form, I just use the simplicity of using an operating system's naming convention to know that we have unique names. Um, we just have, I just have a huge TV shows directory and then sort the shows alphabetically. And then for the format of the show, just a unified format of show, season, X episode, and then the title. So some, very rarely will you ever get some collisions. Sometimes you might get special characters and that throws things off a bit. Sometimes they'll have and the ampersand and and that. So I probably should be using a bit more fuzzy wuzzy. But this is allows to tell us if it doesn't exist. And if we just don't want to download it, we can just touch a file, a Unix touch. Uh, just it creates a blank file with that name. But now we run into a couple of different issues with using directories. Um, do we want to keep the same thing together? So for example, this TV show, The Flash. The Flash is actually the second version. 
Okay. Uh, there was a Flash uh, version of the show in 1990 with John Wesley's ship. And then there was another one started recently that's still on the air with Grant Gustin as the Flash. So it's like, how do I differentiate between those two? I could just rename the directory. But now you have everybody remaking all these shows again. So now you don't know whether or not it's an absolute remake or if they're just continuing the show again. So is it Murphy Brown where she's going back again? Or is it MacGyver where they have a new Richard Dean Anderson? Not the real Richard Dean Anderson. He's awesome. So what about a directory name? So for example, all my Marvel shows are in one place in that TV show. So if I want to make sure that they're going into the same place, it's like, wait, how do I group all of these and give it a special name? And then all of the other problems I have, like what do I want to watch and how do I keep those listed directory? Um, where am I putting everything that I can start with a base directory of everything? How am I storing my TV provider information securely so that I'm not committing it on GitHub? Do not commit your passwords and credentials on GitHub. Maybe other people want to use it so that maybe it's just not me. Maybe I made something good that, hey, this is cool. Yeah, it's a little too much to actually hard code, especially credentials on GitHub. Do not c code your credentials on GitHub. So, now, so it's, how do we store a lot of these preferences? We have settings and settings and projects as we were talking about before, like this television show, how do I list it? How do I know that it needs to have this particular directory? How do I know that it's actually this name of the show as opposed to some weird characters that may be in the name of the show that you don't like to see? You can store in a database, but that still has reliable starting up the database. So maybe on a local machine or something, you may not have that kind of guaranteed place to put it. SQLite, it could, again, it's not as good for dis distribution since it's a single file. Or environment variables where <sighs> storing a list is not exactly the best thing and can get a little bit too much. So I mean, of course, took at this and I said, okay, I got my Bat DVR project. I've got another one project for iPod similar called the Bat Pod. Then other projects I might want to develop. This sounds like the same thing where I could just use inheritance to solve the problem. And in come the bat preps. I know, it's a running gag. But it's actually only about 24 lines of Python, which is actually really beautiful. And I took the inspiration from YouTube DL because their library actually has a YouTube DL config file. So this I configured so that I can store it in either a they're both in hidden directories, either in its own directory with a config file, text file, or a just dot config for in that directory. Um, very simple. All we're doing is just inputting or inheriting this class into any project that we have. And from that, just a simple get preferences call. And the file itself is just JSON. So we can edit it, we can change things around. It's a wonderful thing to have for all the little projects that we do as developers. So there's more to come. And there's always things that can be done, more things that we can add to it because of course a project is never really done. Uh, more networks, more internet sites. It's not just specific to networks. You can even have it running on YouTube or Twitch or any other place where video content is being generated. Just take a look at some of the extractors and you'll think, why did somebody want to make an extractor for that site with YouTube DL? Um, you want to add video. Sometimes you'll get download videos and they'll just bit by bits by bits when you want to just download the whole thing. So that's another part I want to, still want to work on it. I mentioned I have this on an NAS, so I want to, so one, another project I want to try to do is to automatically mount network drives with Python. Um, automate and put it so that it can be placed somewhere easily enough. Or even use a web portal and have it running on a server, like an old Mac Mini that I have at home, or Raspberry Pi. And I've been starting to take a look at ND Scheduler from people at Nextdoor have a wonderful cron tool that has a web interface that's built in Python. So something that, another name drop, I do a lot of those. So what did we learn in the presentation today? 
Inheritance and factory design patterns, they kind of work well. They got a lot of interfaces between the two of them. Everybody's different, that's okay. We can still find a way that we can get everybody together. Keep your preferences local. Streaming is good, but it's not always viable. That's why sometimes we have to make the bad DVR to download these videos and create fun GIFs of them. All the GIFs that you've seen today are shows that I've actually used from the bat DVR. So, fun Easter egg. Oh, and don't commit passwords to GitHub. I'm done. Any questions? No? Over there? I took a look at it. Beautiful Soup was first, but uh, there was a, just a lot more documentation behind Beautiful Soup and a lot more of a kind of interface usability from, because I'd used it already on a couple of other projects. So it, it's, it was just a premier web scraping part of it. I just found Scri uh, Spider a couple of years ago. Mm. Curious to take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. What do we do when we do commit passwords to GitHub? Uh, you want to do a forceful git push where you are going back and actually, once you've gone back enough that you have taken those commits out, you do a git push force. So when you, put, when you force a git push, it actually rewrites the whole repo with all of that local uh, git history. I actually did it recently. Um, I had inherited a repository for, I mentioned at Percolate we had Hack Day, and we had set up a brand new repo, but I didn't want to lose the history of uh, all the commits that were made by the guys who were at Percolate before, but had, he had it, uh, the voting system on a local repo. So once I had the repo, I did a git force push onto our Percolate repo so that we could rewrite the history of a commit. And so everything is kind of still there. With. I was wondering because I've done that before, and there's this tool you can use, it's like all like GFG, I think, where it will rewrite your entire Git history, so you can just like like change your password to like something else. Mm. Get rid of it. That's probably you know, was it BFE history? Uh, yeah, it's like look about the problem with Stack Overflow. I think the answer will tell you the tool you can use. I probably there's some version of Git Force. Anything else? Cool. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>